So we've been looking through the mechanics put the end of this class series of of Zen Buddhism and out with basically these of and graduated into both these attributes, especially in Advaita Vedanta, because they're big on that. The, the attainment is important, uh, and it's more pronounced than in Zen. In Zen, the attainment says, oh, you know, don't talk about that. You know. um, don't celebrate it. Just uh, have, have the experience of it and move on towards, towards Satori, towards that enlightenment experience. <clears throat> so there's a different nature in these. That's why we don't really want to uh, uh, put words in Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa's mouth and say that all religions are the same. Somebody, people have told that to me. Oh, you're a follower, a disciple, or initiated devotee of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. He's the one that said all religions are the same. And so I, I heard that once, and I said, I don't think I'm going to accept that anymore. If someone says that to me again, I'm going to have to tell them how all the religions are so much different. And uh, the methods are different, too, but the essence is the same. And that's pretty only can only be verified for a person who has actually reached the essence. That's, that is, if you've actually did a deep dive into these traditions and found the water to be the same, basically. You dig, dig a deep well and find out that it's the same water in your neighbor's well, as the Venatic story goes. And it's all connected you know, underneath to this great reservoir. And everyone thinks their own well has the best water. <coughs> their own watch keeps the right time. There are stories like that Sharam Krishna told about that kind of uh, naivete in, in religion and philosophy. Uh, so as, as we move on in this way, then taking apart the, the mechanics of a thing, that reminds me that I was talking to my mechanic, my car mechanic the other day, and uh, we were talking about <coughs> Uh, this particular class series that we're doing right now with the Zen ox herding and, and the Advaitic lion taming and uh, how so many correlations are there <coughs> and really finding the source back to Mother India again through, in Zen's case, 52 generations back coming through various countries. Buddhism being uh, very particular about uh, never taking life, uh, never committing violence, which was over here on this other chart we looked at, ahimsa or non-aggression, and how Buddhism moved across all these countries uh, without lifting a sword, practically not even lifting a finger, but lifting feet, you know, mendicants. They walked and spread the Buddhist teachings to different countries, even to royalty. They seemed to have a good in. People wanted to hear about this new religion of Lord Buddha. <coughs> and uh, so in that, in that uh, vein, we're putting our last half on this six-part, six-class series, because I was telling my mechanic, he said, well, what should I watch and, and of that? And I said, he said, can I watch, can I watch uh, one class? And I said, well, that's three hours. Said, oh. Well, I said, well, you could watch the first half. It's an hour and a half. And so he was going, how many times do you do this? How many classes did you give? Well, three. So that's six, basically, six halves. So he was trying to figure out <coughs> uh, which he would watch and so forth. So that's, that's the mechanics of, of how we do it in SRV. We, we just sit and explain the Dharma and talk about the Dharma, question the Dharma, meditate on the Dharma, contemplate the Dharma, live in the Dharma, realize the Dharma, mature it, metabolize it into a higher Dharma, like Ganam, Atma Ganam, like, like we looked at Brahma Ganam at the last chart. So uh, we did a big injection of lion taming there to, to balance out the ox herding, which I've been concentrating on more the first two classes. But let's go back now to, to Buddhism and look at it in terms of of mechanics, dynamics, closer to a method, because if you've lost your ox, or if you're still 
a kitty looking in a mirror and not seeing a lion, then there probably is something responsible for that. And in Vedanta and in Zen, I would say equally, you're not going to blame God. <clears throat> probably won't even hear God talked about in Zen. And in Advaita too, they're, they're getting more away from the personal God. I, see this. I, <laughs> I was writing about that, that God blog yesterday, which you'll see on Monday if you, if you look. And it's about how Sri Ramakrishna said, the ocean is blue from a dif distance, but if you go up close to it and take a handful, you'll see that it's really clear. See? So a lot of teachings around that. Basically, I named the God blog I was writing about it, Up Close and Impersonal up close and impersonal. So you get close to Brahman, you see what it really is. It's not blue at all. That is, it's not Vishnu. Vishnu is God with form. It's Brahman, formless, colorless, absolute, boundless. Vishnu has come out of it. Yo Brahmanan vidadati purvam, yo vaivedamscha prahi no hitashmai. Beautiful sloka is in there about this one nameless, formless being out of which the Trinity came at the beginning of a cosmic age, <coughs> and then conducted that age and went into three more ages similar to it, but longer, to complete the whole circuit of a Maha Yuga, a great, a great cycle of time. And Brahman was standing there foremost the whole time as the backdrop behind it. So if you want to get up close and personal, you go to Vishnu, but if you want to get up close and impersonal, you have to go to the ocean, take a hand of it and see what color it truly is, what its true nature. <coughs> and uh, not many people get the opportunity to do that in a lifetime. If you're talking about Satori, or if you're talking about Nirikalpa, see, or if you're talking about, in yoga, Asampragyata, uh, then very few people have those experiences in any given lifetime. Not that we hear of, certainly. Maybe they're hidden yogis and so forth. But even the avatars and the avatars disciples, called Ishvara Kotis, not very many of them have that form of samadhi either. That's how rare it is. So it throws, throws it back to us that we need to have a method. And I think it's even more important. I ended the last half, the first half of this class, by saying that, that method is really important I'm speaking to the American people. I might as well be speaking to the people of the Kali Yuga because uh, they need to get back on on the uh, straight and narrow with methods. Uh, for instance, Zen sickness, uh, a lot of them is about lacking, is lacking in method. It's brought upon this Zen sickness. A lot of misunderstanding of non-duality in Advaita is brought about by thinking I can be that without paying, you know, proving it with a method. I'm already that, so I don't have to do any work, you see. Well, uh, you know, the, swore, the floor needs sweeping, but I don't have to get up and do it, and it'll just sweep itself. So <coughs> you're going to have to uh, defer to a method. And even the great non-dualists themselves have said they practice methods to keep their mind clear here in, on the earth plane. So much, you know, like Sri Ramakrishna is saying about Sailing ship getting barnacles, it can't move anymore. Waste a lot of fuel trying to, to move through the body of water. And in the harbor, you have, harbor you have to come and chisel those off. <coughs> Lift it out of the water, even a huge ship. So um, the method then is very important to get rid of the impediments that will allow you to have this experience of up close and impersonal with your true nature. It'd say that probably if you have an ishtam, which you should, and you have a vision of the ishtam, then you're getting a vision of Ishvara, and that's all well and good. <coughs> but to get the non-dual experience, very rare. And uh, that should be accepted first, and uh, you should be clear about that. And then you must go about getting from the, if you want to use a saying, from the father, fr from the son to the father, very carefully in that particular level of consciousness, uh, letting go of certain weights, for instance, <coughs> and uh, making sure that no caramels will be clinging to your mind when you, that, will, that maybe will spoil that experience just about when you're going to have it. 
so many like Lord Vashish's stories are filled with that kind of thing. That uh, a person spent so much time practicing, a few decades, and then got to the certain pinnacle where they're about to have the non dual experience. And because of one little, let's put it this way, one little fiber sticking out of the thread, it wouldn't pass through the eye of a needle. Good God blog there, too. <coughs> so, in that way, uh, as Sri Ramakrishna's words, so basically he fell from that position back, had to fall back to the qualified non dualistic position and take stock. You know, where in all of this was I lacking that I couldn't find my ox again, you know, that I couldn't tame my lion once and for all and be in bliss all the time, be at peace all the time see the light all the time, see Brahman in everything, as Jafar was just singing to us before we ended the first half. Jo Kuchahai, you know, I finally realized that my, all exists in you. He's not saying you exist in all things, um, because he, Brahman isn't a thing. You might make a philosophical mistake there that's going to cast you out of the gates of non-duality before you even get close to them by saying, oh, Brahman's in all things. Brahman is the underlying substratum of all things, but all things really are in Brahman. Another good God blog. And so all things are soluble into Brahman, Sri Ramakrishna said. So if you, if you, however you do it, with ox herding or with the six, uh, four treasures and six jewels, or the dissolution of the mind stream practice in both yoga and, Medi and uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Shine, it's called. You're dividing. You're dissolving everything back into that one indivisible, formless, nameless reality. And it must have been three, four days ago. I was speaking to someone in prison about that. How do I work this dissolving of the mind stream process? I've read your book. How do I work this? What are the dynamics and so forth? It would be nice to just say, well, do this, do that. And we have tried that, and it has come back partially effective only. So you always have to look back to some rust that's on the mechanism, uh, which I put up here. Or you have to look back in Zen to the precepts. In fact, it was in prison when I was teaching Vedanta to Americans in prison that <coughs> they were hearing from Christian priests a lot. and. Uh, the only other thing in prisons I could find there was Buddhism. So I'd ask some of the students, oh, we go to the Buddhist, when you're not here, we go to the Buddhist teachings. And, and so they, they would say, they asked, they're asking me to take the precept. Should I do it? I said, well, you, know, it, you make up your own mind. Um, um, I'm, not, I, I'm not giving initiation in prison. I, you get out of prison, I'll give initiation maybe, if you, know, if you have dedication. But uh, the precepts are something that, um, you can follow and uh, that will help you get ready for, uh, will remove the rust off of certain mechanisms in the, in the psychophysical being so that you really will come before the Lord to use a Christian saying, pure and ready, you know, not put off by the first little uh, intimation of something that's untoward or, or suffer any imbalance. <coughs> or feel any remorse or guilt or anything, shame. You'll really be truly ready for this and, you know, and coming to the marketplace with arms wide open, right, is the final stage of ox herding. So to give Zen uh, another look uh, that's not, uh, because the ox herding is on a level of practice, but what about precepts before practice? You can see here, never take life. This is the exoteric side of the Ten Precepts. I looked them up and uh, heard some teachings about them from Buddhist Dharma teachers. There's an exoteric and an esoteric form of them, which um, I'm sure they're not getting that information in, in prison when they're taking the precepts. They're making this very easy for the Americans. So, and for the first thing would be just like in yoga, ahimsa. It's I mean, you could put satcham first if you want, but quite often they say, you know, make sure you get this nonviolence down. You don't harm anything in thought, word, and deed. That would be a good way to start. And 
probably truthfulness might be a little easier to, you know, in thought, word, and deed, too. Truthfulness would be easier to attain if you had nonviolence in thought, word, and deed, because you might go about getting, trying to be truthful and find out you still have violent tendencies. But what if you got rid of the violent tendencies and then go about trying to be truthful? You see? So there is some sort of a pecking order or an order of things. And of course, this is going to be determined by the quality of the person, their abilities and their attributes, which is why we looked at some very sterling attributes in the first half. <coughs> so never taking life would be like one of the very first things as a Buddhist you'd want to do. Uh, never engaging in stealing. What's that in yoga? Huh? Asteya. Asteya, yeah, that's one of the first of the five yamas too. So you've got two yamas right there. You see how similar you could you could put I mean you could put yoga here and do the same kind of thing with Zen. Never being a chaste, what's that in yoga? Brahmacharya, so it's again one of those yamas and niyamas. Never speaking falsehoods. Satcham, right? Never selling or buying alcohol. Well, okay, so Vedanta won't even speak about that. They figure you're over that. Um, uh, so basically, <coughs> I like that about Zen Buddhism, you know, because that, that's, you know, I would say alcohol is probably more of a root of all evil than money is to me when I look at it. <coughs> so uh, never sell it, never buy it, never have anything to do with it. Um, um, you know, maybe use it to sterilize yourself or something. You know, use it for the, for the reason it's here, for the right reasons it's here. But imbibe it. What would? You, why would you ever do that? What to speak of? Um, finding your wife or husband in a bar, or something, <laughs> and getting married and having children, <coughs> and everything that happens afterward, influenced by this intoxicant. So that's. Um, very important in Buddhism uh, at the exoteric level, never recounting the misdeeds of others. Basically, that's non-fault finding in our tradition. <coughs> never praising oneself and deprecating others. I remember how Holy Mother put that, you know, never find fault with others. Learn to look into your own faults. It's one of the last things she said when she was embodied was that. Never find fault with other beings. Instead, learn to look into your own faults. Never being selfish with time and money. In Buddhism, they have that pretty well together, called dhanam. So everyone's going to make sure that they contribute every day or every event. Whatever happens, they're going to give something. And time and money are equally important there to volunteer one and to support the Dharma with the other. <coughs> never engaging in violence and aggression. Very much like never engaging, uh, never taking life, but uh, taking life would be an extreme form of that, of course. So <coughs> there were even some Buddhist monks, that, Tibetan Buddhist monks, that wanted to join in the fight against China, Red China, when Tibetan was taken over. <coughs> And the Dalai Lama said, no, don't do that. You've given up the world. Why are you doing that? So if they hadn't have been monks, then they could have had some reason to enter into a resistance of some kind. Um, of course, Tibet didn't have an army with a lot of power in it. So even on a practical level, it might have been wise not to uh, anger the serpent any, lo any, any more than it was. And uh, so the point then, of course, well taken on either level. And then never slandering the three great ones, you see. The, so basically, <coughs> the Buddhas, the three bodies of the Buddha, uh, three uh, bodies of the Buddha, uh, the, the teachings, the Buddha himself, and uh, the uh, Sambhogakaya, they call it. So basically, those ten are. Uh, easy to listen to because they're, they might say the ethics and morals of Buddhism, but they do go deeper than, um, than face value, let's put it that way. 
<coughs> if you look at the esoteric form, and remember we're speaking about this in terms of making sure that your mind's senses are pure, uh, you know, before you get into a practice of a method, because one of the reasons for bringing this up is that people jump to a practice and a method without a teacher, without the scriptures, and without doing these purificatory exercises. So what else do you expect that you're not going to get success? Or your success is going to come back mixed, uh, mixed results. Uh, uh, a jumble of undigested spiritual moods, as we said earlier. So whether it's in philosophy, study of it, or whether it's in the practice of religion, or whether it's in your own individual practice called sadhana, you know, I want to make sure that before you approach these <coughs> depths of Vedanta or Zen, that you don't have any Zen sickness on one hand, and that you have um, some some very powerful practices, pre preliminary practices you've done that's gotten rid of the rust of these mechanisms. You want to be able to move amongst these practices and carry them off, which is why, uh, as Holy Mother and others said, you know, all these things that you want to do, do them young, because when you get old, it's going to be very hard to do them. The prana is not flowing, your body's getting older. All these things that you want to attain, whether it be anything from pilgrimage uh, to study of scripture and so forth, do these while you're young, while you have the energy, and um, get your preliminary practices and, and your key to enlightenment in your hand before you enter the depths. So <coughs> next weekend, there will be no class here. It might be good to say that now, because we'll be in seminar, and that seminar has is is got a chart in it that's called um, Practicing, practice at the depths is the name of it. Practice at the depths. Some of us have been going at it long enough, 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, of, of practice, that we feel like um, our mechanisms are ready to receive an injection of Brahmagyanam, as my teacher used to say. <laughs> so, poor Swami Sheshananda Maharaj there in Portland with, with uh, the people coming at that time. I want to give the West an injection of Brahmagyan. <laughs> but a little later he's saying, I'm speaking to the American people. <laughs> so so uh, maybe he had a little bit of a new look at the readiness of the American people before he could get, give them an injection. Or you know, maybe an injection might not be so good for them yet until they're prepared for it. In other words, they had a strong mental and philosophical immune system they were non-emotional. They wouldn't react to things. Uh, they wouldn't be arrogant about somebody telling them to change the way they think. Uh, there's all these things that were, are in the Americans uh, who think they know everything, you see. And probably Westerners in general, maybe people nowadays in general. So they're not going to have guru bhakti, you see, and listen closely and follow the tradition was one of his mantras, follow the tradition, he would say. And so they're going to have to neutralize these tendencies, see. And some of them are mentioned there, but others are, can, are, are coming too. So maintain the Dharma. Uh, I think we were mentioning Hanuman and, uh, and Tejavirya, the great strength, Mahavir he was called in fact one of his names. So I think Ram was talking to him once or to one of one of them. He said, make sure that you uh, always be a supporter of the Dharma. Never be a detractor to the Dharma. So always support the Dharma in all ways to all people. That means not just your children and your neighbors and so forth, but the entire human race as we we're talking about. If you want Samadarshitvam, or if you want samasta chitta, as we we're talking about these great attributes, if you want to be a Swami Vivekananda, if you want to be perfect as thy Father in heaven is perfect, then then th these are this is the the ways in which you uh, affect this for yourself and for others. Maintain the Dharma at all times, and of course I just mentioned five or six things you want to do with it <laughs> here at, at Shruti 
smriti, remember it, anubhav, get some experience of it, spread it, and the nine limbs of bhakti of Sri Ram, the second one is spread the teachings to people. Um, you don't have to be a, a great acharya or a teacher to do that. You just understand them and share them, sharing the teachings. Second limb of bhakti in the Ramayana. So I could go on and on about that, but you see on the esoteric side of this, the exoteric would be something there, oh yeah, I think I can do that, probably can do that, you know. Um, but on the esoteric side, the precepts get more demanding. And number two is never failing to seek enlightenment. How about that? You know, uh, have you fallen down in your seeking of enlightenment lately? <laughs> have you ever? Um, have you felt like you wanted to give up? Have you felt like you wanted to turn your back on Guru, Dharma, and Sangha? Because many have. They've betrayed it and betrayed themselves mainly in, as they do that. Or even when you're feeling down and out, that's instead of up and in, <laughs> you're feeling down and out. Do you still put up that resistance against that tendency? No, I'm going to keep up the path. This is what I'm supposed to do. This will change because it's a gunic cycle. I see people in gunic cycles all the time as a Dharma instructor. And that's one first thing I tell them right away, whether they accept it or not or believe it or not. Yeah, I've told you, wait that one out. See how you feel next week. And in the meantime here, you know, do some more practices that will change change the nature of some things that can be changed for the better. The weight of lead might not be one of them, but there are many things that you can change for the better. That's a real powerful alchemy that happens in the mind. And then you've got Vivekananda's good, better, best. You know? So you say, start out with good, and get rid of the negative, start out with good, then get better, and then have the best put it in simple sayings like that. Labor is love. You know. Work is worship. He had all sorts of these, learned the English language just like that. Of course, in India, that's not that hard, but didn't have a heavy accent. People could understand him. His English was great. No heavy accent accompany it. And so he would just come and speak to people and raise them up. Everyone ever heard him speak said they were all of a sudden on the ceiling, as it were. And as soon as he stopped speaking, <laughs> crashing down to the first floor again, or maybe the basement. But uh, that's Brahmatejas and you know, this light by which you can lift people up. But they have to be willing to be in the company of a soul like that and let down their defenses and drink from the mountain stream, as Buddhism would, would, would say. Take a big drought of that pure water. Why give people dirty ditch water to drink when the stream of Dharma is flowing right by? He was talking about a religion and what people were getting fed when he came here with a fallen Christianity at the times and a missing Judaism and so forth. Uh, and it happened in his country too, you know, uh, a completely... Uh, desecrated Hinduism that he wept about, you see, because India was the motherland of these great teachings of Dharma. And that's where these religions came from. Didn't like to see that. So <coughs> fail, never fail to seek enlightenment. Keep that as your highest goal. You can have a penultimate goal, <coughs> another good God block. It's, uh, holding two ideals at once. A man work, reaches out for a rose, and Sri Ramakrishna said, picks it, but on the way pricks his flesh painfully, pulls the rose back, drop of blood there. Person next to him says, oh, that must hurt. It's nothing, he says, it's nothing. How do you, how do you explain that? What kind of meaning can you give to that? Is he meant holding two ideals is difficult. You'll have some pain and suffering doing it, but it's nothing. It's what you need to do. You have to have a goal, and you have to have a supreme goal. 
you have to have a penultimate stage that you want to reach for, and then you have to move on towards enlightenment. And nothing should be able to stop you in your course. That's why you're here. Sri Ramakrishna just put it that flatly, you see. You've come here to realize your true nature. There's no other reason for you being here. Well, if you ask him deeper, he could probably give you 20 other reasons that you've come here, but none of them are going to be effective or successful without this one before the zeros. Covet nothing and be generous. Putting these esoteric Buddhist precepts in English language. Not that hard to do, really. You can still, they still have this nice taste of sweet ethics to them. That makes sense. And th these very things are what's going to <coughs> scrape the rust off the needle, you know, so that it can penetrate or make that eye of the needle free of impediments so the thread, the, the needle can press, uh, the thread can pass through the needle even if there's a little fiber sticking out, maybe. But you might want to wet that, you see, and pass it through the needle. That's good for the subtler things that you need to attain that are going to be difficult at, at the depths, you know, uh, uh, practicing at the depths. Practicing more at the surface, you've got these. They should all be done and accomplished by you, and you should not have any doubt about them. No misgivings about not having accomplished them, getting in the way. Never denigrate the dharmic teachings. So you maintain the dharma, number one. But number five here, uh, you never, as I said, become a detractor for those teachings. They're, if you're talking about beings in the Kali Yuga at this level of existence, at this stage of their awareness, at this um, echelon of their consciousness, Dharma is going to be the most important thing. <coughs> Nothing uh, can solve problems like the Dharma. Nothing in the world. Because truth isn't going to do it for most people yet. I can compare truth to the most corrosive substance in the three worlds. It will burn through everything Soft things right away, hard things take longer. So those, those, those soft things are these Dharma teachings that will burn through everything right away to reveal this truth to you so that you can uh, climb the highest peak like the Buddha did. The great swan that passed on to the highest peak and then still looking for another higher peak. Um, of course, that's not going to be very possible if you have <laughs> that old nemesis called attachment. So always remaining unattached. If you want uh, detachment, chyaga back here, when it becomes more mature, uh, that Vivekananda liked that <coughs> renunciation, uh, that uh, crown of thorns, if you want to put it on Sri Ramakrishna's head, that's renunciation. His renunciation was most natural. Masharada said, most natural. Uh, we've never seen anyone with that kind of spontaneous natural renunciation. It's just like none of this. And he didn't have to practice not this, not this. He just looked at things and saw though they weren't worthy of his, of his, uh, of any ownership. Not even his ego was there to own anything. Who are you? They asked him. I don't know. I keep looking for a me, but I can't find one. So he had like looked inside to his very pure nature and couldn't find a separate self. You have to imagine what that's like, the homogenous nature where all is Brahman, like Jafar was just singing to us. Having, having had arrived there, natural non-attachment. <coughs> keep free of false views. Anyone know what that is in yoga? Or you could just say false views. Branti darshana, yeah. Branti means deluded and darshana means seeing. 
So you want to make sure that you keep free of false views. <coughs> and yoga is specifically allocated to philosophy, philosophical views. Uh, for instance, my watch keeps the only right time. That's a wrong view. My religion is the only right religion. It's a wrong view. And uh, <coughs> it's going to cause nothing but uh, aggression, which you wanted to avoid <laughs> back here at the very beginning, and war between brothers and sisters of different nations. It always has done that, and it always will. So the clear view would be what Jafar was just singing to us. Kaaba, church, temple. Um, you cause all beings to enter in there and bow down. Whether it be in Muslim prayer or bow before the crucifix or bow before the Om sign even, meditate there, whatever you're doing inside there, <coughs> that one being is at the foundation of it all. Uh, it's what I chanted at the beginning of this class. You must see and perceive that one as the ultimate cause of the relationship between matter and consciousness. There's a go-between there, Shaktiman. You know, she'll put them together. And then when it's time to transcend them, she'll take them apart for you too. She'll give you name and form, then she'll strip it away. That's her role in it all. She's the dynamic power of Brahman. So back to Shakti Vandana. I have that devotion to her and faith in her doing that perfectly. Why do you have to get in and muck it up? See, have deep faith in her that she's, she's got the highest. That's why you took refuge in her. Or at least I hope you did, right? Right? You did, all of you? Yes, everyone here in this room all did. I know I did, because on Durga Puja one day at Swami Shishananda Maharaja's uh, ashram, <coughs> he came out with parchment and a gold pen. <laughs> it's the only time I ever see, saw him do that. I don't know if when I wasn't there sometime it happened again, but. He, it was on Durga Puja, so he made us all sign our, our name in gold inks under our, on, on that parchment, on Durga Puja. I take refuge in Sri Durga. You see, sign, okay, sign, sign, sign. That was so beautiful. I verily ran for that pen, giving that. No, I, I almost caused violence to get it, no. So you really wanted to, to uh, sign that document of ownership. There's songs about that in India. You know that it's happened in India, so because there, there are songs about it. I have signed my entire being away uh, in, in the marketplace. You know, Ram Prasad sings to the Mother of the Universe. Can death cause fear anymore? So I have a baya. He says, death cannot cause fear anymore. I've signed my entire being away in the marketplace to the Divine Mother. Moving through these rather quickly, but with enough commentary so you can see their depth and their efficacy. You can see here how now we have explaining the Hinayana, or if you want to call it Theravada, and the Mahayana. That is the lesser vehicle and the greater vehicle. Uh, all running along a middle path, I would say, and all having access to non-duality, like Zen focuses on, um, but also offering up much to consider on the, on the lines of, of uh, precepts. Um, because calling the Hinayana a lesser vehicle only means that it had less people. <laughs> it didn't mean that it was less potent. Uh, that's Lord Buddha's teachings and the Arhats right there. How can you say that about them? And they were the foundation for everything that came after. Of course they were. <coughs> so uh, lesser means, oh, sorry, you have to be a monk to join us. See? So they had to, they changed that, you see, because uh, Buddhism was about to actually, they say, 
go away, die away. So they opened this up, you know, to, to the householders and to others. And uh, they began to take vows like this. They came up with precepts. And it was a good move to keep Buddhism alive. Very worthy attempt uh, and very worthy and very successful too. Although I think I looked up to 10 religions and I think Buddhism's like number eight or something in population still and uh, still growing, you know, as it were. But it's got hundreds and thousands of adherents. <coughs> so uh, if you're championing, championing, championing the Buddhist teachings or Buddhism itself, then you have to make sure you explain this to everyone. Start with, the, say, like the Dhammapada. <clears throat> you know, like in the Dhammapada, you talk about rust, rust of things. So 550 years before Jesus, Lord Buddha was there in India. And so at one time he said something that, you know, rust is the, uh, the great risk of the watchman who's guarding the city gates. Uh, so, so, you know, his lack of vigil is the rust in him. He falls asleep that night and the armies come. And then he said, um, it's a uh, lack of recitation of scriptures is the rust of monasteries. So in the monastery, like with Shankara and where I, with the Ramakrishna order, when, when the Swamis uh, took me in and showed me how they did their daily practices, uh, they would start with you know, a few hours early, early in the morning of scripture study. That's how important it was. They would not give that up whatsoever. They'd recite it, they'd talk about it, they'd meditate on it, they'd read some more. That's how they started their morning at you know 3.30 or 4 in the morning. So that's what you'd have to do, you know, because you've got a lot of work to do later on. And even the monks do. And you know, long before breakfast, you've already done three or four hours practice, you see. Their whole day started out that way. And the room in which they did it was, it had Brahmatejas in it. It wasn't just people that get Brahmatejas. <laughs> Locations get it too. So you're, you walk into it, you go, wow, what happened here? See, like in the opposite way, you know, violence. A policeman walks into a room where a great murder is committed. You see blood on the walls and everything. You say, whoa, what happened here? But on, on the side of the Dharma, you walk into a room where monks have been meditating and practicing every day of their life for years, and other monks have come to replace them, and you're just feeling this great, lifted up by this great atmosphere, and you know why. Uh, so, rust of monasteries is lack of recitation and study of scriptures, Buddha said. One of the earliest teachings he gave that the Arhats remembered. 500 of them, after he passed away or so, monks, arhats, started to dwindle. You see, hmm, we got to do something about this. They're dying off. We're losing this teaching and this stream. It'll come back in another age. But for now, it's got to be long-lived. And so the Mahayana comes, comes along, and they, ex they expand it to include more people, more practices. Even the royalty could get it, and that was a good thing in many cases. Well, I think we'll turn, we'll get do away with animal sacrifice, you see, in India, because that has started to creep in. It hadn't been there with the Jains before Buddha. You see, all of a sudden, what's that doing here, right? And, you know, we'll make people vegetarian, too. So all these positive things at an exoteric level were coming. And you had to have a way, a vehicle to explain it to them and give it to the right people, like the upper class, that is the royalty class. So <clears throat> you have to know the history of Buddhism, you have to know the beings involved in it, and you have to know the teachings that were being given. Because he continued on in the Dhammapada to say, oh, the rest of households, what's that? Lack of sadhana, lack of spiritual self-effort. You see that all around the West. You go stay overnight with someone, anyone. You get up in the morning. Oh, are you going to do your three hours of scripture study? What? I'm going to stuff food down my mouth and rush to work. If I'm lucky, I'll get food. And I'm not going to bless it. 
I'll get some coffee and a donut at work beforehand. Well, where's your spiritual practice? Aren't you feeling rusty? And isn't it coming out in your life later that that rust is beginning to accumulate, corrode everything, the corrosion of human consciousness? You want to keep the mechanism running smooth? It's the other God blog you'll see next week. If the mechanic comes and puts oil in the machine, it runs nicely, Sri Ramakrishna said. If not, it's, it seizes up and shuts down, destroys the mechanism. So, you know, you're the mechanism. Uh, and, the, you know, the mechanic is karma yoga in you. And pouring the oil in is love. The mechanic has to make sure everything's done with love. All the gears in there is your philosophy. It's got to work right. It can't be bronte. It's all got to fit, and it will fit in these traditions if you look deep enough. And the machine is just sitting there running smoothly. What yoga is that? Raja yoga. Because you're meditating with eyes open or eyes closed. See, it's all a meditation. Holy Mother said. So that's how a simple word, sentence, how they're surrounded Krishna's mouth can be interpreted uh, and also can be interpreted not only in the way of how things should be, but how things have unfortunately become. And we'll look at that before the end of the class. These four yogas are here and some of the teachings that have to go along with keeping the rust away, keeping the corrosion off of us. And how to do that. Some beings are just like those monks, they're just into it. That's what they do every day. That's their vow. Those vows, these whole, all these vows are based in their vow, you see. They're not having to practice these anymore. These are in them when they start to take their vow of renouncing, renouncing the world. You see. They're ready for that. They're not going to give up enlightenment. <coughs> so the tenth and final one there is offering charity to spiritual teachers uh, and, and that's fun again. And we, we saw that in the quote I should give my poor and to the those three or four ways that's a good God blog actually three or four ways in which people use their money let's see Sri Ramakrishna talked about uh, uh, lose their money I'm sorry <laughs> use their money it would be a hopefully a dharmic thing but you know, basically it's to doctors because they overeat and eat poor food, so their money goes to doctors. And lawyers because they commit evil deeds and they get sued and have to get a lawyer involved, so that. And third way is uh, to quote evil children because you've got, in the worldly people, they don't have children that are anything but worldly like them. They're raised in worldliness, what did you expect? Mango, apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? So these ways in which people spend their money who are uh, adharmic, a nice word to go against the dharmic, you see, adharmic, uh, that has to be uh, better given to help people. We were talking about that at Satsang yesterday, if you remember, how to help people with, with uh, uh, your what you earn, and, and dharmically what you earn. Um, let here, here we are to finish out uh, Jujukai, which is Japanese for these, these uh, ten, and I'm calling it here subtitle because it's so close, the yamas, yamas of Buddhism, but the sincere practitioner should be watchful over is speech well restrained in mind and commit no unwholesome deed with his body let him thus purify this threefold avenue of karma and tread the path made known by the seers and sages the 500 arhats a few of them said i remember lord buddha saying that put it down you know so the dhammapada grew like that First Buddhist scripture, the Lord Buddha's own sayings, like going to Jesus and 
hearing the apostles, you know, actually, oh, I remember Jesus saying that. So there's one of the things that he said. So you see how broad-minded he was and, and how, uh, uh, how knowledgeable he, he was about future events, what's going to happen, and uh, how compassionate he was for people that they can work themselves out of the transmigratory cycle and reach the goal of human existence. Down below, well, down below is a quote to end this chart, and it's just like this. Pranayamam prachaharam nitya nitya viveka vicharam japya sameta samadhi vidanam kurva vadanam mahadavadanam Baja Govindam, Baja Govindam, Baja Govindam, Mudamate, Samprapte, Sanihite, Kale, Nahi Nahi Bhakshati Dukarena Karane, Baja Govindam. That's the Sanskrit by Shankara, which says, Engaging in spiritual practice prior to initiation and implementation of advised preliminary disciplines results in future, I'm sorry, results in failure to comprehend the teachings and to act in accordance with the Dharma, to meditate properly and to worship in the right spirit. So those four yogas, as I was saying when I started into this last half of this class at the end of the series, means practicing at the depths. You want to make sure that, um, and that's why we got into rust and all these things, and moral precepts, the importance of them. You want to make sure these are in place before you do this higher, deeper practice, uh, because then it's easy to fall out of those um, when you don't have all of your your uh, yogic powers together, as Patanjali would put it. First thing, yoga, wants you to do is get your powers back. And you do that by, where was it? Breathing, is it somewhere here? Or maybe it was in the other chart. You do this by breathing exercises um, and uh, <clears throat> balancing the prana, getting a hold of the prana and the psychic prana after that. Don't forget that. Don't just leave it as a, your, your lungs as a pair of bellows, as Shankar <laughs> I'll find that verse for you and sing it. You can't just, you know, turn your lungs into a pair of bellows and think that bellows and think that you're going to get anywhere. Oh, I did my breathing exercise today, and I did too much of it, and my mind got imbalanced too, which happens to people. Holy Mother said. So, um, but if you do that uh, under with guidance, you know, those breathing exercises, then uh, you can uh, balance the prana and get your powers back. The prana is going in the wrong directions, like the five horses of a chariot going down different paths. You see, uh, that's the five senses, right? Going, you know, each one to take a different path. But if you have the prana, which is the reins, you get the reins back into your control and pull them together. They'll go down the road you want them to, and not their own road. And that's true of anything, like objects, and. Uh, everything finding its right place in your balanced life and mind. Otherwise, imbalanced life and mind doesn't lead you anywhere but to corrosion and, and tragedy. Like <coughs> lack of vigil is the rest of the watchman at the city gates. That's what it leads you to. You let yourself and everyone else down. In the time remaining, which I think we can do, let's look at rust. We talked about lead and gold today. <laughs> Let's look at what happens to to steel and iron and so forth in this in this process. Say goodbye to Jujikai, but keep it all in mind and recall it later for Manana. <coughs> The corrosion of human consciousness was a chart I put together thinking about all of these things. And about 15 minutes or so left, we can conclude this um, 
and connect it to ox, ox herding and lion taming. Where, <coughs> since Lord Buddha was obviously aware of rest because he had some of those great sayings in the Dhammapada. Um, <coughs> this is uh, very apropos. Lack of spiritual self-effort is the rust of households. So that's the particular part of his saying that I wanted to pull out because I am speaking to the American people. <coughs> so basically we want them to get a sadhana. We want them to get a practice. We want them to take a method and we want them to hold to that method and follow the tradition till they're ready to take on deeper and higher levels, till they can practice at the depths effectively and not fall out what did Father of Yoga call that, falling out? I don't, I'm not surprised you don't remember it. Anavasti Tatvani. Anavasti Tatvani, seven syllable word, that's all. Or, Alabda Bhumi Katva, Alabda Bhumi Katva, another seven syllable word, you see. So that's what happens when a person is not ready to practice at the depths tries to and falls back. And is the failure itself the worst thing? She says, the goddess of wisdom over here says, basically it causes you to form a habit of falling out. The second time you make the pitch or storm the gates, you have less confidence of making it because you've failed once. So this is something that's very important, why you go by stages, why Sri Ramakrishna taught by avastas. It's almost like avasta, avasta you see, tatvani. You, you go by stages and you make this, you purify your mechanisms. You put the oil in the machine every day. You do your sadhana every day. You look for rust, sand it off. Tears of devotion, get rid of the rust on the needle, Sri Ramakrishna said. All of these things you do day to day to day to day with patience and perseverance until finally you see the light at the end of the tunnel. That is, Maya is beginning to abandon you. you see? I'm not having any fun with this guy. See? I think I'll go away. Come to find I was never real in the first place. Shoot, what do I do? So in this way you have this analogy I came up with. Actually, I didn't really come up with it. One of my students is a, has a construction site, a worker, a boss of a construction site. So he told me one day that he was, it, it was in Portland, so very rainy there, and in the winter. So they have a construction site going and this big rain comes along. So they abandon the construction site. So you usually cover things, right? but I think some bucket of new nails got, wind blew off the tarp or something. So he came back after this rainy period and this bucket of, of nails had turned rusty and some of them had began to turn into, how to say it, just, you know, rusted pieces of iron, like many nails rusted together. See? So I say it here, like nails left out in the rain in a bucket on a deserted construction site, gradually fusing with one another into lumps of rusty iron, similarly, the neglected and untrained mind forms complexes of residual karma called samskaras that impede spiritual progress and dictate the unhealthy condition of future births in ignorance. <sighs> That's a long sentence, I know, sorry. So basically it's much like lifting the ship up, you know, to get rid of the barnacles. That's amazing, these cranes that can lift these huge tankers out of the water. And, you know, it's going to take a lot of effort to get rid of the barnacles that have accumulated. But that's why you want to stay on top of it, you know, the rest of households, the rest of monasteries, or the rest of the city, the watchmen at the city. So how this goes on then is I put in the four corners the four yogas. So if you want to look at it from Raja Yoga, and we have just the time to do this, um, there you see it. Uh, neglect, neglect of recitation and memorization of scripture. If you're practicing the meditation yoga, you want scriptures. And a Zen sickness would be without scriptures. I'd say practicing meditation without knowledge of scriptures is a kind of Zen sickness. 
because it's certainly that way in Vedanta. You know, says, You're meditating? Well, what are you reading? Would be the first question from a Swami or a guru in that tradition. Well, I'm not reading, I'm just meditating. Well, then you only have one avenue, and your meditations should be tested by scripture. How do you get love? Shruti. Shruti. And Anabhava. Vivekananda said, Shruti is hearing the scriptures, reading the scriptures. Smriti, remembering them. And Anubhava, oh, I'm getting experience now from them. Well, what made you forget that and just meditate? If you meditate daily. Well, there's the other side of the coin. I got into my book and I didn't meditate today. See? I mean, Holy Mother said that too. She said, you know, if you try and meditate one day and it's just not possible, you cannot convince your mind to get into a meditative mood. Don't leave your seat for that hour that you've dedicated to practice, but get a good scripture and read it, and then meditate. See? Pick up a, the Gita, a sl take a sloka, memorize it. That's shruti, I mean, sorry, that's smriti. See, be flexible. You don't have to be carved in stone and immovable. It's your practice and it should be flexible. Failure to teach your children how to meditate. I, I just chose three rusty nails here that are some of my favorite in the Raja Yoga. I mean, this could save them so much angst that you went through. People are talking about this all the time. I don't want my children to live the same poor life I did. Oh my God, give me a break. If you don't want them to, and you wouldn't have had to either, if you had have practice the yogas. If you had have had a daily sadhana that kept the rust away, you would have never experienced any of this. You'd be a luminary right now. Like Swami Sheshananda, bless him with peace, used to say, you know, he said this at a Kata Yoga, a Kato Upanishad class once in front of us, he said, all of you men, if you spent half as much time reading the scriptures as you do trying to please your wives, you'd be illumined right now. <laughs> It's <laughs> pin drop silence, you know, but it's true. Sri Ramakrishna used to say that. Oh, you know, they, they stand up and sit down when their wives come in the room. See? But are, are they sitting down to meditate? Or are they standing up to serve others? So one has to be, if we're talking about your children, the future children of humanity, possible rishis that like India had, then you've got to take the time. And again, they talk about quality time. What, what are you talking about, quality time? I have to spend quality time with my children. What's that? To share some old photographs of their ancestors? Or are you going to teach them the Dharma and make them seers so they'll never have to suffer? Or if they do suffer, they'll suffer, suffer consciously. You see. They know, they'll know the first noble truth. What is that? Suffering is. They'll come to know that. And if they just know that much in this lifetime, then their future lifetimes will be better. There'll be that much less rust on every nail that they pick up. Over here in Gana Yoga, taking the two most powerful yogas first, as far as uh, uh, content at least, there you see carelessness in implementing spiritual discrimination half digested, a jumble of half digested spiritual mood. You have to make sure that your discrimination runs the whole gamut of your life and work would, would be where it's missing. See. Probably work and attending upon your guru is where discrimination is missing as much. Uh, people come to me, wow, you're a great master. What are you talking about? But then they're gone couple months later, if I was a great master, why aren't you still with me? You see, Whether it's true or not, it's not the point to me. It's why you left the path two months later. I never caught a scent of you again, Vivekananda said. You'll never catch a whiff of him again. I mean, is that the courage of your convictions? So ignoring the need to contemplate the wisdom of the seers. This is good at the end here. I'm giving you some Zen scolding. You see, all of you are listening. 
so that we get serious about this, about practice, about rust, if you want to put it that way. So uh, ignoring the need to contemplate the wisdom of the seers, it's really back to where do I find the seers' best teachings in the scriptures? Which scriptures? The revealed scriptures. What's a revealed scripture? <laughs> That's what you need to discriminate. <laughs> That's what you need your discrimination for, is to find out which of them are just talking about who owned what tent pig and what generation and where it came from and pages and pages on it. Or what's my relationship to God, both as two and as one? What's my identity with the Lord and what's my relationship to God with form? There's what you need to know. Put that down as one if you're precepts. And finally then, forgetting to spread the precious Dharma in the world. We saw that as one of the two of the precepts of this, right? You share those teachings. You never denigrate it, of course. Down to Bhakti Yoga, as we have just five minutes, allowing worldly talk to replace talk of God. <laughs> and, you know, it's very rare to go out in your backyard and you see your neighbor over the fence and you start talking. And the first words aren't going to be, don't you just love God? Isn't he, she just the best? Who's your ideal? And what's your practice? See, How does that make you a better person? I mean, where's that conversation going on? Well, it's not amongst people who are mammon lovers, who are materialists. It's not not the last thing in their mind. So where is that dharmic neighbor or that dharmic neighborhood? I might have to go to sadhu satsanga for that. I might have to go to a monastery for that. And hopefully they're not rusty. <laughs> They'll have their scriptures ready to relate to you like the Ramakrishna order does. Books, books of them, all wonderful. And also becoming complacent about reading out the Bhakti Sutras to family and children. So Bhakti has its own set of scriptures, like Narada's Bhakti Sutras and so forth. Those are what you have to make sure, because they're not so difficult to understand, those are what you have to give to your children, mouth to mouth, mind to mind, in a transmission. That's quality time. Even five minutes of that is far outstrips any other kind of time you can spend with them outdoors or on a trip or on a vacation. And it outstrips anything they're learning in school, if you ask me. These should be subjects in school. What are you taking? What's your sixth grade teacher teaching you? Well, there's yoga. Oh, you mean twisting yourself into pretzel shapes? No, no, not that kind of yoga. That's not effective for, for my growth. They're giving me jnana yoga. They're giving me dharma. They're giving me teachings. They're giving me bhakti sutras. They're teaching me how to meditate. And sometimes schools do that. You see children, time, quiet time isn't just getting a pillow and a teddy bear and lying down in a corner. They have them actually sitting. And there doesn't need to be any religious input in meditation. It's actually better without it. You get the scriptures later when you are practicing at the depths, when you're older and you can understand them. Otherwise, what good are they going to do you? The third pick here with Bhakti Yoga was failure to make use of the scriptural, the spiritual teacher, holy company and recitation of the mantra in everyday life. The mantra, I think, is shared by all four of these yogas. I've always taught that. It's almost a fifth yoga, Japa. A mantra <coughs> connect, but just like the word connects with all four of these, so does the mantra. So in bhakti, that would, you know, in jnanam, that would be let's purify the mind, right, with recitation of the mantra. But in bhakti, it would be let's increase our devotion to the Lord. Uh, that will make me cry tears. That will dissolve the rust off of the needle of my mind, so they can penetrate again. Is it's blunt, you see, it's not going through the material. 
of Maya. Actually, I'd gotten into that as karma yoga, isn't it? So, leaving work undone, incomplete, or abandoned due to spiritual practice is a, is a rust, kind of rust in karma yoga. No, I don't think I'll do that, <laughs> that work. I started out, but I'm going to give it up. Why? Because it got too hard. Uh, press on a little more. You know, pierce through it. Uh, prove to yourself that you can master that. Uh, those who have, have uh, become aware of the Atman and have, to any degree, realized the Atman, Vivekananda said, they should say to themselves, I can, I can accomplish anything through that, through the Vedanta. Nothing can put me off if I, if I am a Vedantist. So that's uh, how he wants us to think about this great darshana. And under karma yoga, allowing money instead of service to become the main aim of earthly life. Uh, so we already talked a little bit about that here, how to transform that perspective of mind into that. <coughs> so something about the corrosion of human consciousness and uh, in atmic lion taming uh, that you might want to seek as far as method. And uh, as far as the 10 stages of ox herding, you might want to put these in place, make sure they're all there before you go looking for that ox you thought you forgot or you thought you lost and um, might come back all the quicker to you, all sweet and deep. And uh, we will <coughs> post these classes then for you to review those of you who want to go back and savor some of the Dharma in them. And then we will, next week, as I said, go on seminar, which actually is titled, uh, at least subtitled, like you know, Practicing at the Depths, one of my charts, and how Vedantic tools work, how, how they work at a deep level. Not just that I hear them a book, I try and practice them. Well, I didn't quite work for five years. Let's see why. And let's make them effective, because they are. They have been for millennia and for hundreds and thousands of people. Here we'll end with a chant. <coughs> Om Bhadram Karni Bihi Srinayama Devaha Bhadram Pashema Akshabirya Jatraha Sirai Rangayish Tushtravasas Tanavir Vyashema Devahitam Yadayahu May we see with these eyes what is good and spiritual and hear with these ears what is noble and uplifting. And may we, while worshiping the Lord and Mother of the universe, with healthy minds and bodies, live a life which is beneficial to ourselves and to all other beings. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om Tat Sat.